So what we're going to talk about tonight is neck masses, neck lumps. And we're going to talk about neck anatomy, and we'll do a little bit of a uh, kind of a mini anatomic uh, tour of what's going on in your neck. It's a very fascinating and beautiful area. We'll talk about some of the more common types of neck masses, and then we'll talk about some of the nitty gritty. What do you do when you actually find a lump in your neck? And at the end of the talk, um, I wanted to focus more on some of the things that I uh, encounter every day in my practice as a thyroid surgeon, which is really the issue of the expansion and explosion of diagnosis of neck masses, specifically thyroid nodules, and the possibility or the concerns that we are overdiagnosing and overtreating thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer in the United States and worldwide. So that's uh, some of the public health uh, matters that we'll address at the end. So the neck is a fascinating area. It's the confluence between two very important er anatomic areas of the body, which are the head and the chest. And this is a painting by Modigliani, Italian artist, uh, around the turn of the 20th century. And he loved necks. If you look at Modigliani uh, paintings and his sculptures, uh, all his figures have these very long, elongated, swan-like necks. Uh, and and it's, it's a very um, fascinating area because a lot of anatomic structures course through it. And let's take a minute to feel our own necks. Now, this may seem a little bit odd, and some people do get a little bit <laughs> freaked out pressing on their own, so don't press too hard. But uh, the area is, is quite sensitive, but there are a lot of structures there. So the first thing that is going to be very easy for one to feel, men easier than women, but is your so-called Adam's apple, which is also called the thyroid cartilage. And I'll point it out here using the, the mouse right here, the thyroid cartilage, that very firm cartilaginous structure very prominent, as I mentioned, in men, uh, less so in women. And that's a constant thing. Now, people wonder, why is it called the thyroid cartilage when here's the thyroid cartilage, here's the thyroid gland? They're actually quite far apart from each other. Well, the reason that the name thyroid came about, the T-H-Y-R uh, prefix means shield. And it was thought that these are both actually shaped very similarly. You can see the thyroid cartilage is shaped very similarly to the thyroid gland. So it's really based on shape, not on location. And it's a cause of common confusion amongst medical students when they're trying to learn the anatomy of this area. So you can feel your thyroid cartilage, your Adam's apple. Just behind it is going to be your larynx, your voice box. If you go down just a little bit, about a centimeter or so below, you're going to feel another firm cartilage which is called the cricoid cartilage. That's right here. That feels like a very firm ring. And that may be a little bit harder to find in some people, but that is a pretty consistent landmark. And these two structures are very important in emergency medicine and emergency surgery because they bound something called the cricothyroid membrane. That is the easiest spot in the neck for a medical professional, hopefully, although <laughs> some may be asked to do this in a wilderness scenario or an uh, emergency scenario, where a medical professional can access the airway if they need to perform an emergency airway operation. And that's a situation where, for example, someone has choked, commonly it's usually a piece of steak or something uh, kind of thick and obstructive, and you can't do a Heimlich, you can't get the thing out, and you need to get access to the airway. The cricothyroid membrane is the spot where you're going to access it. And it's not infrequent on these uh, television shows and movies for some kind of medical professional to have to access the airway. Oftentimes, it's very dramatic with a drinking straw or a ballpoint pen or something. Uh, hopefully, uh, you'll have access to something a little bit more um, <laughs> secure than one of those structures. Uh, usually, a very small endotracheal tube will fit. But what you need to do is to basically find that spot, make an incision, and then you can directly access the airway. And it's a life-saving maneuver. So again, uh, in emergency situation, the cricothyroid membrane, just between your thyroid cartilage and your cricoid cartilage, that cricothyroid membrane. Other structures to note here include the thyroid gland itself. And it's not always palpable in most people. Most people have a pretty flat thyroid that kind of wraps around the trachea there and resides back. But as we talk about later, thyroid nodules and thyroid enlargement are pretty common, and you can sometimes find it. So if you want to try to find your own thyroid, find that cricoid cartilage, and then go down even further a little bit. So here's that cricoid cartilage. Just a little bit further, about a finger breadth below that, is going to be your thyroid isthmus. That's the bridge of thyroid tissue that connects the two lobes. And then on either side is going to be your thyroid gland. And that's where a physician will palpate to try to find a thyroid nodule or thyroid enlargement. <clears throat> 
Other structures that we can find here include your carotid artery. So if you just kind of feel your trachea, feel your thyroid, uh, thyroid cartilage, and you go just a little bit to the side, you'll feel the pulsation. And you sometimes people have a slow pulse, so don't get impatient. Just wait a second, and you'll, you'll feel it. And it's going to be right up there. And the carotid pulsation is pretty close by to where the thyroid gland and the, uh, the trachea and, and thyroid cartilage all reside. And it can be bridged. It's cut away here, but the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the big beefy muscle right here, that kind of covers you here. And immediately next to you, and you won't be able to feel this, but immediately next to the carotid artery is your jugular vein. So when you talk about going for one's jugular, that's, that's what you're going for. Now, it's always interesting to me, and I don't know if uh, Dr. Tavis wants to comment in his uh, trauma experience. In the movies, it's pretty easy to slash someone's neck. But uh, in real life, the sternocleidomastoid muscle generally does a pretty good job of protecting. It lies in front. You have to cut pretty hard to get to that jugular, because it's kind of residing behind. That being said, we still saw plenty of penetrating uh, trauma uh, injuries with uh, people getting sliced in the neck. But really, the, the jugular vein right there, if you're going to try to kill someone <laughs> in the neck, that's the, that's the main structure to go for. The carotid artery would be much more difficult to get through because of the kind of rubbery, tough muscular uh, layers, whereas the jugular vein uh, can be quite uh, easily uh, cut if you can get to it. So those are the main structures in the neck that we're going to be talking about. This is a side view now. And this is uh, meant to highlight the presence of lymph nodes. And there are numerous lymph nodes. They estimate between 200 and 300 lymph nodes in the neck total. And these are them drawn in various lymph node basins. And you can see it's a very, very richly populated area. There's two sites that I want you to focus on. Right here is what's called the supraclavicular area. So the supraclavicular fossa, if you feel your own collarbone and go just behind it, there's a little indentation there. And that's a very common place for lymph node enlargement to occur. And it's a place where you can sometimes make a diagnosis of some neoplastic processes, some cancers and other kinds of uh, tumors. Another place that people commonly talk about is the submandibular area here, right under your jawbone here. Your submandibular glands are salivary glands. So those are not lymph nodes, but they are close to a lot of lymph nodes. And it's very commonly found that you'll have some salivary enlargement or submandibular enlargement. And people tend to think, oh my gosh, that might be something worrisome. That might be uh, some kind of uh, lymph node metastasis or lymph node cancer or something. But again, rest assured, the, thyroid, the submandibular um, glands are normal salivary glands that can sometimes get a little bit bigger or smaller depending on what you're eating and maybe if you're having uh, uh, some kind of uh, salivary uh, issue. But the lymph nodes themselves are not right there. They're just a bit over to the side. And the lymph nodes that we feel for, besides those supraclavicular ones, are mostly what we call the jugular chain, which run right along that jugular vein. And the way to feel those is to feel that edge, the medial edge of your sternocleidomastoid muscle, and then press in. And then you shouldn't be able to feel any lymph nodes. But there are times when patients have either cancers or metastases where you can feel the lymph nodes along this jugular chain. The neck has been a subject of fascination, as I already mentioned, of artists. And there was a period where the female neck was actually considered a very sensual and beautiful area. This is a painting by the Italian artist Viverini during the Renaissance. And it's called Madonna and Child, but I could argue you could also call it Madonna and Goiter, because she has a fairly prominent neck. And if you go look at a lot of Renaissance paintings, the exposed neck, they weren't really allowed to show cleavage of the, of the chest, but they could show necks. And the necks were considered, again, a very sensual area. And a lot of these paintings will demonstrate thyroid enlargement and fullness, which was considered a sign of beauty. This is a painting by Artemisia Gentileschi from the Baroque period, so a little bit after the Renaissance, but similar thing. This is actually probably hard arguing an even bigger goiter. This is Judith and her servant, and again, very prominent thyroid. So next time you're uh, looking at Renaissance paintings or Baroque paintings and looking at female figures, just take a look at the neck, and I can almost guarantee you it's going to be a little bit full. And it's not just um, limited to Western art. This is a Nigerian wood sculpture demonstrating a very prominent goiter. And uh, Central Africa certainly a site of endemic goiter. And the artists were depicting what they saw. And this is a very obvious neck mass there. 
Much of what I learned about art and endocrine abnormalities came from my mentor, Dr. Orlo Clark, whom some of you may be familiar with. He is a professor emeritus here at UCSF and was considered, is considered one of the worldwide experts in the field of thyroid surgery. And he was my mentor and trained me. And after he retired, he and his wife, Carol Clark, who was a prominent English teacher at the Crystal Springs Upland School down on the peninsula, they wrote a book about endocrine abnormalities in art called The Remarkables. You can find this on Amazon or at the UCSF library. It has wonderful analysis of goiters, also some of the other endocrine abnormalities, gigantism, dwarfism, bearded ladies like are on the cover here. And uh, it's, again, a very fascinating book that will teach you a lot about the presence of endocrine abnormalities in art. So when we talk about neck masses, it's very easy to get confused quickly because there are so many different possibilities. Again, the neck is a very packed structure or a packed area with many vital structures that can get enlarged. And when I teach medical students, it's very difficult sometimes to corral them because they think, wow, gosh, what could it be this, could it be this, could it be this? When we talk about generating a differential diagnosis, which is kind of the spectrum of things that a mass could possibly be, it can get quite broad quite quickly. So it's useful to think about neck masses in three different boxes. Congenital, which is relating to uh, masses that are related to um, embryology and usually are found in pediatric uh, patients, in younger patients, although they can be found in adult patients, but congenital abnormalities. Infectious or inflammatory, so these would be responding to various kinds of bacterial or viral infections. Inflammatory, some of the rheumatologic diseases will be accompanied by lymph node enlargement in the neck. And lastly, and the thing that of course is probably most scary and kind of leaps to the forefront of one's mind when they start feeling for lumps, are neoplastic processes, which don't always mean cancerous diseases. There can be benign neoplastic processes leading to enlargement of structures in the neck. So I'm going to go through a few different kinds of neck masses that one might encounter. And I'll break it down into these different categories. So we'll start off with some congenital masses. So if you look at the picture here, this is a face-on view. This is the patient's chin here and the front of the neck. And you can see that sternocleidomastoid muscle here. But your eye is drawn to an enlargement here on the lateral aspect, so to the side. And this area would correspond to kind of the top of your sternocleidomastoid muscle here. This is something called a branchial cleft cyst. And this is an embryologic malformation. So when you are a fetus, and every one of us was a fetus in their mother's belly, you have a whole complex system of what we call clefts, pouches, and arches up here in the neck, almost like a fish's gills. And as you develop as an embryo and as a fetus, and you kind of get towards your more mammalian uh, state, those arches and clefts and pouches form various structures including things like the thyroid gland, the parathyroid glands, the various blood vessels I showed you, uh, some of the other vital structures of the neck. But as may sometimes happen with embryology, sometimes the migration doesn't happen all the way or there are defects that happen along the way. So this is a sideways view and this is that sternocleidomastoid muscle that I showed you. This is your trachea and that thyroid cartilage that I showed you before and up here, those branchial clefts, which started up here as, like I said, almost like gills, as they descend and form other structures, sometimes little remnants can stay behind. And they can form in various places from as high up as next to your earlobe here, angle of the jaw, all the way along this path. And there can be cysts all the way up and down here. And what happens with the branchial cleft cyst is sometimes they will fill with fluid and then come down. So what patients will often report is a Something enlarges, then gets smaller again, gets enlarged, gets smaller. And they are sometimes prone to infection because the fluid inside it can get infected. In children, they can be a little bit alarming. And so you feel something like that in a kid. Uh, you you want to get, uh, get attention. And there are times when these things can get big enough. I once removed one of these from an, uh, a guy at the, uh, at the VA hospital. It was so big, it was actually impairing his ability to swallow and to breathe because it was impinging on his esophagus and his trachea. That's rare, though. More often, it's going to be a cosmetic defect, kind of like what I showed you here, where if you weren't looking too hard, you might not notice it, but then your eye can be drawn to it when it starts to get bigger. That's a branchial cleft cyst. And most of them, as I mentioned, are probably diagnosed in children, 
but they can be diagnosed in adulthood, and most of the time they are recommended to be, to be, to be removed to lower the risk of infection and also the cosmetic <coughs> deformity that can, that can result. That's a lateral congenital neck mass. This is a central or medial. This is something called a thyroglossal duct cyst. And you can see here in this, I think this is a child uh, picture, this is uh, an enlargement that shouldn't be there. The thyroid cartilage is probably here and just above it is this round mass. And if you feel it, it'll feel something like a, um, I mean, it depends I, actually, but uh, usually it's kind of firm, but not as firm as bone. And it's filled with fluid. So it's gonna feel like a pretty tight, uh, small water balloon perhaps. And these also are prone to possible infection and these can actually develop cancer. 1% of them will develop cancer within them. And you can see the location is in a slightly interesting location just below the chin, just above that thyroid cartilage. Thyroglossal duct cysts are most commonly diagnosed in children, but they can be diagnosed in adults. And actually, as just so happens, I did an operation for a gentleman yesterday who's in his mid-40s and never even noticed it, but he was in the process of being worked up for a thyroid nodule. And during the course of the ultrasound, they commented that they saw this thing there. And so during the operation for his thyroid, we also took this thing out. This is a side view, which shows your jawline and chin here. And this is what your tongue looks like when in cross or in side section. This is that thyroid gland. This is the, the side of the thyroid here. And this is that thyroid cartilage. And this is the thyroglossal duct cyst. So this route of travel is very interesting. So I showed you the branchial cleft cyst travel, which is along the side here. This is down the middle. The thyroid gland, believe it or not, starts off right at the base of the tongue when you're developing embryologically. And it migrates straight down. And almost every patient, when you remove their thyroid, you will find something called the pyramidal lobe, which if you want to say the thyroid looks like a butterfly, it's kind of like the upper central part of that butterfly. And the pyramidal lobe is the remnant, the embryologic remnant of this pathway. It's almost like a Hansel and Gretel breadcrumbs path. And this pyramidal lobe is showing you, pointing to where that thyroid came from. Well, in some patients, as I mentioned, this thyroglossal duct doesn't close all the way. And it has this little pouch, which can be prone to filling with fluid, getting infected, and possibly even developing malignancy within it. So when we identify these, most of the time, these also will get removed. Now, the added little twist, when surgeons started removing these things, they would find that they would sometimes come back. And they say, gosh, how did how that happen? Well, as it turns out, this bone here gets involved in the action. The hyoid bone is a structure, and it's, it's actually much harder to feel, but, and, uh, but it's going to be above your thyroid cartilage and right under here, under your chin. The hyoid bone also originates from the same area. And the cyst cavity or cyst capsule originates from that hyoid bone. So what surgeons learned is that unless you took out a portion of that hyoid bone as well as the cyst itself, you'd be prone to, to, to developing recurrence. So now the standard operation for thyroglossal duct cyst is not only to remove the cyst itself, but it's also to remove the central portion of the hyoid bone. And I can tell you as a non-orthopedic surgeon, I'm not used to cracking through bones. And so to do these operations feels exceedingly brutal because most of thyroid surgery is pretty delicate. I'll show you some pictures later on of the thyroid. Pretty delicate and you have to limit the blood and you're trying to manipulate structures as delicately as possible. But then to do the delicate removal of this thing and then to have to take a bone cutter and cut through this bone, it's really quite brutal. And uh, it's, it's one of the more kind of, Con one of the operations that has a stark contrast between what you're doing here and what you're doing here. But unless you remove that central portion, the patient is at high risk for developing recurrence. So that's thyroglossal duct cyst. So what are some of the more common infectious or inflammatory neck masses? Well, the most common thing we see in kids are what we call reactive lymph nodes. And this is a very common site for one to, to find these. My son has had one of these back here. He's 13, probably for, since he's been a, a baby. I can always, very reliably, if I'm uh, kind of goofing around with him, I can, I can feel, I can even see it back here because he's kind of thin. 
And that area is a very common place for one to develop nodes. And most of the time, they're just like a little round BB or something, and they move around pretty nicely. So if it's been there for a long time and doesn't really change in nature, that's almost certainly what we call a reactive lymph node or just a, uh, just a uh, very prominent uh, superficial lymph node. So most of the time, if these are not new entities, you don't have to worry about them. And as I mentioned, kids get these all the time. You can have some infectious diseases that lead to swollen cervical nodes. The most common thing, of course, are the common upper respiratory infections and flus and other things that we all get during uh, the winter season. But there are some more severe infections that can lead to swollen nodes. And one of the more common ones that we encounter in pediatrics is mono or mononucleosis. And one of the more common sites that you're going to identify in large lymph nodes are these two spots here, what we call kind of a postericular node right here behind the, uh, behind the ear, and then submandibular kind of in the same area as that salivary gland. And it's very common to identify those. So when the doctor's feeling you around here, if you've got uh, fever and, and, and other kinds of symptoms like that, that's a very common site for uh, lymph nodes to be enlarged. Mono, uh, due to Epstein-Barr virus, uh, has a whole prodrome which doesn't just involve those lymph nodes up there, but can lead to swollen liver and enlarged spleen. And uh, as uh, many of you may have encountered or had kids that went through this, you have to limit your activity for a while, avoid contact with others, and it's really just kind of uh, symptomatic benefit things, uh, the rest in fluids and uh, ibuprofen, Tylenol, those types of things. My wife, who's a pediatric hospitalist, just told me about a kid uh, with mono on her service right now at the inpatient ward who had such a swollen liver that she actually was having trouble with abdominal pain. They thought initially she might have a gallbladder issue or some other kind of major gastrointestinal thing. And it turns out she just had a very large liver from mononucleosis. Same thing for the spleen, which you normally can't feel, but the spleen down here sometimes in mono can get so large that it'll go past the rib cage and you can feel it when you palpate that side of the abdomen. There are a variety of neoplastic entities that can involve the neck nodes. In addition, something I come across very commonly, and we'll talk about this in greater detail later in the talk, are thyroid nodules. So thyroid, again, your thyroid gland, if you want to feel it, is going to be just below your cricoid cartilage and to the side here. And thyroid nodules are pretty commonly seen in patients. And it depends how you look, whether you're feeling for it on physical examination, or more commonly nowadays, actually, whether you're doing x-rays or CT scans, ultrasounds in the area, you can encounter thyroid nodules pretty commonly. The neck, as I already mentioned, is kind of a confluence between the head and the chest. So when people get head scans for a variety of reasons, they will identify thyroid nodules. When patients get cervical spine, CT or MRIs to look for enlarged discs or other kinds of cervical spine issues, the thyroid gland is right there in view and can, you can find thyroid nodules that way. And then for chest scans, it's very common to get chest scans of the, of the lungs and the other things to look for you know, um, lung masses or for pulmonary embolus or things like that. Again, the, the chest is right next to the neck, and thyroid nodules are found that way. And I would estimate in my clinic every week, at least one or two of the patients show up at my door because they've had a thyroid nodule identified during routine evaluation for something else, a so-called incidentaloma or incidental thyroid mass. This patient here has a pretty obvious right thyroid enlargement. And you can see it's pushing forward that sternocleidomastoid muscle and sitting right there on the right side. Left side looks pretty normal. This is just what it looks like anatomically. Just to review again, this is that thyroid cartilage with the larynx behind it, that cricoid cartilage, and here's that cricothyroid membrane. And below that is your thyroid gland sitting like a bow tie or a butterfly on your neck. And then here's that thyroid nodule that you can feel. Occasionally, these can get big enough, or a thyroid goiter can get big enough to actually shift the trachea over to the point where it's pushed over, and you can see that on an x-ray or on a CAT scan, and you say, what's going on? Well, there's a mass here that's kind of pushing the aerodigestive structures over. I already mentioned that the differential diagnosis for neck masses is quite broad. And if you break it down into those categories, as I mentioned, congenital, infectious or inflammatory, and then neoplastic. I think that's a good way to kind of at least triage in your mind where these, uh, what, what are the most common causes. This is a, a mnemonic, which I'm not actually a very big fan of, um, these mnemonics, which medical students often use to help remember things. But this is one way to break it down by various uh, sources. 
Another way to look at them is to go by anatomic location. So if you break the neck down very, very precisely in anatomic regions, these are some of the things that can be found in each of these. But the most important thing is not to look at this and say, oh my gosh, what am I, you know, how am I gonna possibly diagnose this? It's really to keep in mind the broad categories and then to use clinical judgment. What are the more common things that are gonna be seen in this particular patient based upon their age or based upon some of their other history and other factors? And we'll go into that in just a second. So how do you evaluate a neck mass? Well, these are some of the more important questions that we always ask in all our patients. Well, of course, age plays a big role. And as I already mentioned, congenital things more commonly seen in children, although they can be seen in adults, the more the neoplastic processes more likely to be seen in older patients. The duration of time. So if someone's had this thing for years and years, less likely for that to be something to worry about, whereas something cropped up and hasn't really gone away. And usually the typical time course, we say if it's persisted for two to four weeks, because sometimes you know an enlarged lymph node or a swollen submandibulian or something like that will persist for a few days. But if it goes on for, let's say, two to four weeks, it should be uh, kind of called attention to. Recent infections, so as already mentioned, upper respiratory infections, various bacterial and viral things often will involve uh, uh, lymph nodes in the neck. And so if someone's had a recent infection, that's uh, more likely culprit for causing a, a node or a mass in the neck. Other risk factors, which I'll go into in, in the next slide. And also, how does it feel? So if you take a feel of these things, and you can tell quite a bit from just palpating, sometimes these things are soft and very mobile. But more worrisome are the neck masses that we call hard or fixed. Hard to the point, you can feel thyroid nodules sometimes that are like a little rock there. <clears throat> Fixed structures are ones that don't move and we can do a couple different maneuvers to try to elicit that. So for example, it's very common in the clinic for us to give a glass of water to a patient, ask them to swallow and you can watch and see if that, no that nodule or that mass moves. You can feel it and see if it moves when they swallow. And if it's fixed, it's more likely or more, more worrisome that it might represent some kind, of some kind of cancerous process. So these are all things that I take into account when I'm evaluating a patient with some form of neck mass. I always like an excuse to show pictures of my kids. Those are my kids looking skeptical there. So in um, younger patients, as I already mentioned, it's more likely that a neck mass is gonna be a congenital structure and you can base it on the location and the duration, those kinds of things I already mentioned, but also some infectious or inflammatory processes. Less likely malignant, but again, if it persists beyond a couple weeks or so, it should still be evaluated. In older age, and it's getting to the point, I was reviewing my clinic charts uh, for this week, and almost every single one of the patients I was seeing is younger than I am, and so I started to uh, get a little bit worried that I'm into this category now. And indeed, the textbooks define older age uh, when you're looking at neck masses is greater than 40. I say life begins at 40, maybe even later. Uh, but the uh, concern when you find a neck mass in a patient who's older should be slightly higher for the increased overall risk um, of, of cancer or some kind of other um, neoplastic cause. So I'd say most neck masses in an adult, if they persist past a couple weeks, should get evaluated. And what are some of the other concerning risk factors? I don't know if you remember these ads, Joe Camel there glorifying cigarette smoking. Thankfully, those, uh, that, that character has been done away with, but there are still plenty of uh, cigarette ads and we have other new kinds of uh, tobacco products to worry about. But tobacco use overall does increase your risk for developing head and neck malignancies, lung malignancies, other things which may lead to neck nodes or neck masses. It's been reported that heavy alcohol abuse will put you at higher risk for certain types of neck masses. I already mentioned HPV status. Uh, so I, I mentioned Epstein-Barr before, but HPV status uh, can increase your risk for squamous cell uh, cancers. And immunocompromised patients, almost by definition, are at higher risk for different kinds of infections, which may manifest with masses in the neck. This is a very complicated algorithm, but it is the one that the American Association of uh, otolaryngologists and head and neck surgeons endorsed as a clinical practice guideline for what to do when one encounters a neck mass. I just wanted to call attention to some of the big decision branch points. 
And the first one really is, does the patient have signs and symptoms of a bacterial infection? And if so, you go down this course, which is to treat it with antibiotics and see if it gets better. But other suspicious findings may lead you into this path, which would be things like tobacco use and uh, firm nodule and you know, what they say right there, a mass fixed greater than two weeks, other suspicious findings. And then you can go down a whole list of things and we'll talk about some of the diagnostic studies and other maneuvers that we use to help work up and, and diagnose neck masses. But again, this is kind of the baseline algorithm that clinicians are, are told to use in evaluation of a neck mass. We have a variety of imaging studies at our disposal if we want to study and examine and, and characterize or better characterize a neck mass. CAT scan is one of the most commonly utilized ones, CT scan. And this is a cross section of the neck. And you can see a variety of the structures which we highlighted on that anatomic drawing. So if this is the front and this is the back, this big black space, that is your airway. That's the trachea there. Adjacent to it, you can see the sides of the thyroid gland. Those are the lobes of the thyroid gland. Here are the jugular vein and carotid artery. You can tell that this is the artery because it's round and it's got a more muscular wall, whereas the vein is more distended and a little bit more uh, oblong in shape. These are those muscles we talked about, the sternocleidomastoid muscles, and this is the spine. You can't really see it very well here, but the esophagus would be just behind the trachea here. So you can get a lot of information with a CAT scan. It allows you to look at the lymph node basins, as I already showed you on that anatomic drawing. The various lymph nodes can be identified next to the jugular vein and various other areas. It can show you the contour and the character of the trachea and esophagus and whether those have been pushed aside or invaded. It shows you the thyroid, although it's not perfect for looking for thyroid nodules, it can be useful for identifying thyroid nodules. And then it looks at the muscular structures and some of the other areas posterior. CAT scan is great, but there's radiation involved, a little bit more cost, a little bit more of a hassle to order for a patient, whereas ultrasound can be done in the office. And it's very useful. It's really become an extension of the physical exam for endocrine surgeons, which are the thyroid surgeons, the kind of surgery that I practice. So we do an ultrasound in almost every patient that, we're, uh, that we are evaluating in the office. And it's very straightforward. It takes just a few minutes. It's non-radiation and it doesn't really hurt. The sound waves are painless. All it is is a little bit of goop or a little bit of gel on the neck. And you can get a lot of character, excuse me, you can characterize and see a lot of different structures. Not quite as good, doesn't penetrate quite as deeply as a CAT scan, but you can get a lot of information from an ultrasound. And this is a nice ultrasound. My, my current boss, Dr. Quan Yang Du, talks about the Chinese bridge right here, like the bridges you'll see over in Golden Gate Park in the Tea Garden. Uh, over, this is the trachea right here. And then the thyroid, you can see, it's nice and smooth, gray, no nodules identified. This particular scan doesn't show you the carotid artery and jugular vein, which are out here, which are very clearly delineated on an ultrasound. It does show you the muscles here. You can see sometimes depth of penetration can be an issue because there's acoustic shadowing. There's shadowing behind the airway where you can't penetrate back here to where the esophagus is, and sometimes there are hidden nodes back here. So there are limitations to ultrasound, but again, it is a painless, non-radiation study that can be very helpful in certain patients who we, whom you we are trying to characterize or understand better what the neck mass looks like. Fine needle aspiration biopsy has really become the first line diagnostic study when you're trying to figure out what is going on with a particular neck mass. And not everyone's going to get this, of course, but if there's any concern for possible malignancy, it is a very, very effective study. Now, of course, there are certain patients where you have to do something a little bit more invasive than just using a fine needle. But this is a fine needle, outpatient procedure done under local anesthetic and usually done with ultrasound nowadays, which can really help you to characterize and then guide the placement of that needle. And it is a very fine needle, 25 to 27 gauge, which aspirates a few cells from the lymph node or the thyroid nodule or the structure that you're trying to sample, puts them in here in a little saline suspension. Then what you do is you squirt out those cells with a little saline onto a slide, fix the slide, and then study it under the microscope. And it's a field of uh, pathology analysis, which actually 
one of the first places in the United States to do it was here at UCSF. Dr. Britt Marie Young in our pathology department brought it over from her native Sweden in the 1980s and really revolutionized how we characterize thyroid nodules and it's been expanded to include lymph nodes and some other structures in the neck. Some of the limitations, of course, it's cytology. So what you're getting is a sample and you might be getting it from just a little part of the structure in, in, in question and you might not be sampling the right spot. You might be missing entirely and just getting normal thyroid. There are crazy stories of people sampling inside the trachea or inadvertently getting nerves and things like that. So you have to make sure that the person who's doing it is experienced in guiding that needle. The other thing is that you don't get tissue architecture, meaning you don't see the actual structure that you are trying to sample. You're just getting a little bit of cells, which you then get, as I said, squirted onto a slide. So you're not getting how those things are configured. And so there are certain patients where you have to do either what's called a core needle biopsy, where you take a larger sample, which can show you some of the tissue architecture, or more commonly, you can do what's called an excisional biopsy, usually for lymph nodes that are superficial, where you take out the entire lymph node, so that way you can get tissue architecture and the pathologist can do additional studies. For example, if you're trying to evaluate a patient for possible lymphoma, they now do all sorts of hybridization and staining and other kinds of uh, studies to characterize that lymph node to try to to, uh, to try to diagnose lymphoma, not just that it's lymphoma, what specific type of lymphoma it is. And that's all done on the fresh lymph node that's excised rather than this needle biopsy technique. But for most patients, needle biopsy is probably gonna be the first line uh, because it's less invasive and uh, again, can be done as an outpatient procedure. But in selected situations, you're gonna do core needle and or excisional biopsy. Now I wanted to shift attention to talk a little bit about thyroid nodules, because that's my area of expertise, and it's actually one of the most commonly encountered neck masses, as I already have discussed. And we always joke uh, amongst the endocrine surgeons that if we wanna get really busy, all I gotta do is I gotta go down to the Muni Stop or Union Square and start ultrasounding people off the street, because if you start looking, you will find thyroid nodules. They're considered to be palpable in 5% of women and 1% of men in the United States. And then depending on how you're looking for it, I already mentioned, if you do radiologic studies, you come across them pretty commonly. The number we quote, we estimate that more than 50% of the population is walking around with a thyroid cyst or nodule of some kind. When we do autopsy studies, we find them incredibly commonly, and not just thyroid nodules, but actually thyroid cancers. In certain populations, for example, in some Scandinavian nations where they've done autopsy studies of patients who have died from something else, colon cancer, a stroke, a heart attack, and they take out their thyroids in their post-mortem evaluation, there was actually a study where they found 35% of the population had occult, undiagnosed papillary thyroid cancer, which is the most common, most indolent type of thyroid cancer. So, very similar to the prostate, which I know you uh, talked about in an earlier lecture in this series, very similar to the prostate, the thyroid harbors these small malignancies which are subclinical very commonly. And the question is, of course, what to do with them if you do find them. As you get older, you're more likely to develop a thyroid nodule where they estimate that it's up to 60 to 70% of patients over 60 to 70 might have a thyroid nodule or cyst if you look hard enough. The risk of cancer varies, again, based upon other factors. So the patient's age, their gender, family history is a very important risk factor. So a patient who has a first degree relative with thyroid cancer is two to three times more likely than the general population to have thyroid cancer themselves. And radiation exposure is a very interesting environmental factor. And we don't mean radiation like dental x-rays, we mean ionizing beam radiation. So it's very common in the 50s and 60s up into the 70s, for external beam radiation to be used for a variety of non-malignant conditions. I don't know if any of you remember, but there was a period when patients would get radiation therapy for such seemingly benign things as tonsil enlargement, thymus enlargement, ringworm, acne, and it worked pretty well, but unbeknownst to the clinicians at the time, a decade or two later, those patients are at high risk for developing thyroid cancer. And the University of Chicago was a hotbed for radiation research for <laughs> reasons that we all understand due to its involvement with uh, Enrico Fermi and the Manhattan Project. 
And so they had a lot of radiation isotopes and radiation therapy that was developed at the University of Chicago. But some astute clinicians in the 1970s began to notice an, a bump, an uptick in the number of patients with thyroid cancer. And they were able to trace epidemiologically that all these patients had received therapeutic re radiation a decade or two before. And this was called, at the time, the Chicago Endemic. And it was something that reached um, a lot of uh, news agencies. A lot of people started to get very um, much more aware of the dangers of therapeutic radiation. And it, this link between thyroid cancer and radiation, thankfully now we limit radiation therapy for, to, to malignant conditions for the most part. But unfortunately, there have been some other nuclear disasters that have led to an uptick in thyroid cancer. For example, after the Chernobyl disaster in 1986, the incidence of thyroid cancer in children in Eastern Europe, specifically the, the place that was most um, closely studied was Belarus, the incidence of thyroid cancer skyrocketed. And all those patients, when you take out those kids, when you take out their thyroid and you test their tumors, they, you find a very, very specific genetic mutation that has been turned on by the radiation. And it was consistent throughout all those uh, Belarus, uh, Belarusian kids who had uh, thyroid, who were diagnosed with thyroid cancer in the decade or two following the Chernobyl disaster. I anticipate we're going to see a very similar thing in the aftermath of the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster in Jap Japan. Overall, the risk of thyroid cancer within a thyroid nodule is probably somewhere between 7 to 15 percent. We usually quote 5 to 10 percent in that ballpark. Again, depends on other factors. And if you're getting evaluated for a thyroid nodule, well, of course, as with anything, you do a complete history and physical examination, focusing on whether or not the patient can feel it, whether it's been there for a while. You also ask them about elements such as the family history and any history of radiation exposure. And then when you do your physical examination, if you can feel it, you want to see if the thing moves, if it's soft or firm or hard. And then you can also at the same time feel for any lymph nodes in the area because patients with thyroid cancer not uncommonly will have lymph node metastases in the general vicinity along that jugular chain which I showed you on the anatomic drawing. You can get a blood test to look for your thyroid function. It's unusual for patients with thyroid nodules to have any kind of thyroid uh, function abnormality, although occasionally you'll find what's called a toxic nodule, which is a hyper-functioning, autonomously, autonomously functioning thyroid nodule. But a TSH level is generally sufficient in your screening or looking for any kind of thyroid function abnormalities. Ultrasound is really our first line radiologic study if we're going to look and investigate a thyroid nodule. And there are a series of criteria now based upon how big the nodule is, its appearance under ultrasound, other clinical factors, which will determine when we will order a fine needle aspiration biopsy of a thyroid nodule. And when we used to do thyroid FNA, when Britt Marie Young brought it over from Sweden in the 70s and 80s, it used to be pretty simple. We would say benign, malignant, and there's some indeterminate categories. But in the past decade or so, we've gotten a little bit more confusing. And this is an area of a lot of um, consternation when my surgical residents and medical students have to learn it. But the basic idea here is we now have six different categories of possible results. So anytime you order a test, anytime you order a study, you want to know what are the possible outcomes. Well, there are six possible categories based upon these 2009 gui uh, guidelines and criteria published by the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, so-called Bethesda criteria for thyroid FNA interpretation. And I'm not going to go into great detail, but what you can really see here is that, well, first of all, there's an easy category, which is non-diagnostic or unsatisfactory. As I mentioned, occasionally you kind of miss your target and just get a bloody sample or get some muscle or something like that. So that is pretty easy. You just repeat the biopsy. But then some of these other categories, you run a spectrum of malignancy risk all the way from benign to malignant. And there are these indeterminate categories. But you can see the numbers go up the lower you go in this scale, or the higher you go, I guess, to Bethesda 6. And nothing's perfect. So even a benign thyroid biopsy, there is still a 3% risk. And if you read the pathology reports from our cytopathologists here at UCSF, world-class cytopathologists, they still put in that there's a 3% risk of possible cancer within this so-called benign nodule. And that's due to either sampling error, malignant transformation over the course of time, or some other possible errors. And so nothing 0% in medicine. We usually quote about a 3%. However, most of these patients can be followed up 
with either ultrasound, physical examination, other things, just to make sure the nodule doesn't grow or change over the course of time. But again, as we get higher in this um, Bethesda um, classification scheme, you can see the risk of cancer goes up and we do different things based upon what Bethesda class people land in. Well, thyroid doctors and thyroid surgeons weren't satisfied with that. We decided to make it even more complicated and more confusing. And in the past decade or so, there have been a variety, a whole cornucopia of molecular tests which are now used to help stratify risk of cancer within thyroid nodules. It's a burgeoning area. If you go and look at uh, some of the most rapidly growing um, literature in thyroidology, it's really in the area of molecular diagnosis because people were not satisfied with just that cytologic interpretation where you just look at the cells under the microscope. They wanted to get a more precise molecular profiling. And this is just, and you're not supposed to really register any of this except to see that there's a lot of options on our menu now. And there are a variety of molecular tests. Now the issue is you don't want to use these tests indiscriminately because they cost money and they can lead to a lot of confusion. In a, for example, you've got a patient with a benign nodule on cytology, but if you did a test and you got a false positive, which are you supposed to believe? And people tend to believe the molecular test because it seems like that's going to be more accurate. But as has been shown time and time again in a variety of studies that have come out over the past decade or so, these are fraught with some issues and they're not perfect by any stretch. And you can see that the predictive values go all over the map. And it really does depend on what's called your pretest probability. What is the likelihood that this patient has thyroid cancer? Some of those other factors we talked about, family history, radiation exposure, size of nodule, appearance of nodule, et cetera. Using your clinical decision making or clinical judgment to help factor whether or not, first of all, you're going to use this test, and then how are you going to interpret that result? I can tell you in my own clinical practice, I really only order the molecular testing if I'm looking for a reason not to operate, meaning if there's a patient whom, who has medical comorbidities, really terrible heart or lungs, really older and doesn't really want a surgery, I'll order that test sometimes because if it does come back as benign or, or less worrisome, then we'll have a little bit more kind of reassurance that we can continue to observe. But there, if, if there's a patient who's already got a big mass that's kind of hard and firm, they've got a family member with thyroid cancer, why would I order, even if the, the cytology result is indeterminate, why would I order this extra testing when I know in the end, no matter what that testing shows, that patient is almost certainly going to end up with a thyroid operation. So we have to use these tests judiciously. There are a lot of them out there now. A lot of people are making money off these uh, tests. But again, it's something that is still in evolution in terms of how to best integrate this into clinical practice. This is just another study. Uh, this is a, a review article um, actually authored uh, by uh, one of my colleagues at University of Pittsburgh, co-authored by our current chair of surgery, Dr. Julianne Sosa, and looking at the whole panoply of molecular testing um, uh, options on the table. And you can see almost all of these, when you end up here, you pretty much end up doing surgery anyway. And so unless you're really looking for a reason not to operate, oftentimes these tests are not necessary. So I wanted to use my last uh, few minutes before we get to question and answer to talk about an area that I think is an increasing problem, not just in thyroid um, medicine, but really in American medicine overall. And it's the issue of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. I've spent all this time talking about various ways to diagnose and treat neck masses. But the concern nowadays, and it's a legitimate concern, is that we are, pr we are probably overdoing it in some ways. Because as I already mentioned, thyroid nodules are very common, and the majority of them are not going to cause a problem. And even if they're cancerous, as I'll show you, sometimes even those don't require very much in the way of treatment. But overall, overdiagnosis and overtreatment is a big public health problem in the US. Enough so that there's now a conference, international conference, annual conference on overdiagnosis, and they estimate that more than $200 billion is spent in the United States every year on unnecessary testing and treatment. And we don't have to look very far. We just have to cross the Pacific to get to a very, very interesting warning tale about the dangers of overdiagnosis and overtreatment, and that is in South Korea. In 1999, the South Korean medical system, and it's a national uh, healthcare system there, decided to create a national screening program targeting various types of cancers, including thyroid cancer. 
And one of the tests that they recommended was routine cervical ultrasound, even for younger patients. Well, as I already told you, it's very common to have thyroid nodules, and in some patients, those will be thyroid cancers, but they're occult subclinical thyroid cancers. But if you start looking, you're gonna find them. And there was a true explosion in the number of diagnoses and subsequent operations for thyroid cancer in Korea over the ensuing decade. It was a 15-fold increase. It was actually the, rap the, the most rapid rise of any cancer diagnosis in the history of measured cancer epidemiology in just the course of a decade, a 15-fold increase in the diagnosis of thyroid cancer in, the, in South Korea. And the vast majority of these were micro cancers, less than one centimeter in size. If you kind of look at the tip of your own pinky finger, that's a centimeter there. And these, the majority of these were less than that size. And in 1995, 15% of all thyroid operations in Korea, South Korea, were for micro cancers. It jumped to 56%. So more than half the operations that they were doing for thyroid disease or thyroid uh, cancers ended up being micro cancers. And this, of course, came at a cost in terms of the financial expenditure so that you know, those surgeries and those hospitalizations and other testing and treatment aren't for free. But there's also morbidity. When you do thyroid operations, even though these risks are low, there is a risk of damaging the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is the nerve to your voice box, leading to voice change and voice hoarseness and damage in voice quality. And there's also the parathyroid glands, which control calcium in the bloodstream. And when you do overly aggressive thyroid surgery, you can damage or remove those parathyroid glands, leading to permanent low calcium in the bloodstream, which sounds not so bad, but can actually be a very debilitating condition, requiring round-the-clock calcium and vitamin D administration. And patients actually have a very difficult time leading a normal life because they're always tingling, which is a sign or symptom of low calcium. They can get muscle cramps and spasms. They can get heart arrhythmias. They can even get seizures in advanced cases. So this is not, there's no free lunch. So when you do all these thyroid operations, you're going to have an increase in the risk of low calcium and voice damage. Well, as with many perfect storms in healthcare, technology got involved. And believe it or not, some surgeons in Korea started to revolutionize and advance techniques with minimally invasive thyroid surgery around the same time. And it kind of makes sense, because if you have this 15-fold increase in the number of patients with this new diagnosis, you say, OK, what are some of the ways that we can streamline or improve the surgical removal of the thyroid gland? And the technique for endoscopic and then eventually robotic, and this shows a surgical robot aiming towards that poor little thyroid gland, the techniques of minimally invasive thyroidectomy and robotic thyroidectomy were revolutionized in Korea. And the personal story I have with that, one of the true godfathers of minimally invasive thyroid surgery is a gentleman named Wung Yoon Chung uh, at Yonsei University in Seoul, Korea. And he was doing research with us at UCSF in the mid-2000s. And he was a good guy, very quiet. And when he was going back to Korea, he said, I'm going to revolutionize a technique to remove the thyroid gland minimally invasively through the armpit. And I was working in the lab with him at the time, and I said, yeah, good luck with that. That sounds crazy. Well, he went ahead and he did it. And he actually developed an incredible technique. It's very elegant, actually, using the transaxillary approach through the armpit, getting the thyroid out without leaving an incision on the neck. And it's a really fascinating technique. But then one has to ask, a lot of the patients that are getting the operation probably don't need that operation. And so it's a very, very interesting public health issue. And what they found after a decade or more of studying the incidence and then treatment of thyroid cancer, this is in South Korea, you can see that huge rise in thyroid cancer incidence, mortality rates from the disease stayed essentially stable during the time, same time period, which means that we were finding all these things, operating on these patients, but we were not making a dent in the mortality rate. We were not really helping save lives by doing all these operations. No change in overall death rates, huge increase in costs, the number of operations, and morbidity. And the South Korean government has recently called for the efforts to possibly scale back, but it's really hard to change your entrenched practices. And this was concerning enough and raised enough of a ripple in the uh, public health world that it reached major media uh, markets. Uh, 
Here in the New York Times in 2014, front page article, study points to the overdiagnosis of thyroid cancer, and then an op-ed written by um, a uh, internal medicine doctor at uh, Dartmouth at the time, is this truly an epidemic of thyroid cancer? Um, so we're seeing something different. It's not a um, uh, significant rise in disease because of a new infectious agent or environmental exposure. It's an epidemic of diagnosis. I couldn't help but get in on the action. I wrote an article in um, Pacific Standard Magazine uh, around the same time saying that basically sometimes you actually don't need to have surgery for this. So that the motto of surgeons is when in doubt, cut it out. But one of the keys is making sure there's actually a problem to take care of. And in the United States, we like to think, yeah, you know, we're not so uh, crazy as to have this kind of nationalized screening program, but we're pretty close in that we do a lot of scans for other reasons that end up picking up thyroid nodules. I already talked about the fact that CAT scans of the chest, CAT scans of the head, ultrasounds of the neck, or CT scans of the cervical spine, all of these will pick up thyroid nodules. And the incidence of thyroid cancer in the United States has exploded. When I first started in practice more than a decade ago, we used to quote about a 20 to 30,000 new cases per year incidence of thyroid cancer. Now they estimate more than 60,000 new cases a year. That continues to rise. Now interestingly, some very brave doctors, uh, both in Japan and in the United States, have started looking at the question of whether these microcancers specifically need to be operated on at all. For decades now, at the um, in, in one of the clinics in Japan, they have been looking at the question of observation, what's called active surveillance, of microscopic thyroid cancers, and they found very, very excellent rates where the majority of patients never need any kind of intervention, no surgery, no nothing. And here in the United States, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York also initiated a similar trial, and they published their results in 2017 looking at observation versus operation for these microcancers. And again, the majority of patients did not ever have any kind of growth or change in those microscopic cancers and did not require any form of surgery or intervention. So what can we do as doctors, as clinicians? Well, I teach all of my residents, fellows, and medical students, before you click, and it's always a click on a computer nowadays, before you click on the order, when you're ordering a test, think about why are you ordering this test? What information is it going to give you? And how is it going to change your management? So don't just order things willy-nilly. And it's very easy in this day and age, because it is just literally a click on the computer, to just order a whole spectrum of tests if you're worried about something. But you have to think a little bit more rationally. This is a picture of uh, Thomas Bayes, and I'm not going to get into the concept of Bayesian analysis using pretest probability as a way to guide decision making and, clini and clinical practice. But it's very important that we always think about what is the pretest pre probability of the disease or the entity that we're looking for. And you also have to talk to your patient about why you're doing each of these tests, and you also have to put things in context. This is the reason I'm doing it. This is what I'm looking to try to find. And nowadays in, in modern medicine, it's so easy. There are so many laboratory and diagnostic tests at our disposal. It's harder in many ways to exercise. And rather than selecting which test to do, it's really it's which test not to do, how to kind of sit on your hands in some cases, and to use clinical judgment rather than just relying on a whole spectrum of tests. And we always talk about the fact that, you know, if it looks like a nail and you've got a hammer, then you're going to go after it. And I think the South Korean um, example is one in which you had thyroid cancers all over the place and you had this powerful new hammer of robotic and minimally invasive surgical technologies and uh, a lot of thyroids came out that probably did not need to. So with that, I'm actually going to close and I'm going to open the floor for any questions that you might have. And I, again, thank you for your time and attention on this rainy night. Thank you.